Politicians. We all love them, right? In the United States, we the people vote to elect representatives, mayors, governors, senators, and presidents to run our country for the best of all Americans. We elect them to strive for fairness, prosperity, and hope. Though we may elect them for those purposes, we don't see them as the harbingers of honesty and integrity. We don't exactly believe they really work on behalf of the people. But why? Politicians make promises they can't keep. They lie, corrupt, abuse justice and power. Not all politicians may partake in this, but there's been enough cases in U.S. history to which the people cannot trust the government to an efficient extent. So what's behind all of the deception and corruption? Most likely, money. Cash is king in politics, and whoever has the most of it has the most power. Money has been behind power for thousands of years, and especially in U.S. history. Before most people could vote, the only people who could vote had to own property, and the only people who ran for Congress or the president were rich elites. That really has not changed much even in today's politics. Most politicians are rich, and they can get there by the financial help of big companies and lobbyists to expand their power in politics. Money is also essential for political campaigns to thrive as on every campaign website you will see a big donate button. However, the generous donations from the people just doesn't exactly cut it to gain a good advantage over your opponent. While campaigns spend money to raise awareness and make the candidate look good, certain groups called political action committees or PACs, do the dirty work to try and get that small edge over the opponent. Certain PACs are able to raise unlimited funds from anyone to campaign on behalf of your candidate. What we'll see is how deep the financial rabbit hole goes, how greedy and dirty has become, and how money really does influence politics. Let's start in the 1970s. In 1971, the United States Congress passed the Federal Election Campaign Act, or FECA, which enacted sweeping laws to regulate political campaign funding and spending. Many campaign finance laws were passed before, but not quite as strong, paving the way for new laws. The law helped implement stronger disclosure requirements for candidates, parties, and political action committees meaning these groups were pressed to show campaign information and who gave them money. Unfortunately, the law was not strong enough and was quite hard to enforce. But attention for this act would soon be emphasized a year later, when five men from President Richard Nixon's re-election committee broke into the Democratic National Committee at the Watergate Hotel to wiretap phones and steal information. The burglars were caught, and the committee was investigated to see how connected they were to Nixon. Nixon did everything in his power to cover up the investigation and raise hush money to the burglars. Nixon was soon caught due to tapes in his own office, and Congress began proceedings to impeach him, but Nixon would resign the presidency first. The Watergate scandal revealed many flaws in the campaign finance laws, which caused Congress to fortify the FICA bill in order to make the Federal Election Commission or the FEC. The FEC was given executive authority to enforce election and campaign laws, but even the new amendments for the FEC weren't enough to prevent backlash, as Senator James Buckley sued the FEC and the US government, as he claimed the 1974 FICA amendments were unconstitutional, as he claimed the law interfered with the First and Fifth Amendment, arguing an obstruction of free speech and due process. Seven justices of the Supreme Court sided with Buckley, stating the opinion that although the government could limit contributions to campaigns and candidates to prevent corruption, the government could not limit spending by individuals, campaigns, or candidates, as that would be a breach of the First Amendment. They claimed that if campaigns were limited on how they can express themselves to the public, that would abridge freedom of speech. This Supreme Court opinion was one of the first opinions that set the line between expenditures and contributions, which would cause even more debate on how specifically campaigns could take advantage of the rule.
After Buckley v. Vallejo, a new term called soft money began to appear, as campaigns and candidates sought to circumvent the FEC and the new Supreme Court ruling. While the new FEC laws set the cap on how much groups could give to candidates, called hard money, others began funneling money to parties instead of candidates. However, the FEC also had a law stating parties could not use those unlimited funds to influence elections. So instead, they engaged in party-building activities, such as advocating a certain law or voter turnout. The concept of indirect campaigning and fundraising would remain a common theme for campaign finance to this day. Soft money was attempted to be restricted several times in the 90s, but was unsuccessful. In 1995, Republican Senator John McCain and Democratic Senator Russ Feingold worked on a bill together to bring in new and sweeping campaign finance reform. The bill died, however, in the Senate in 1998. But the senators soon revived the bill in 2001, and the bill was once put again on the floor, and was finally signed into law in 2002. The sweeping bill would implement a ban on soft money donations to political parties limited advertising from supporting groups 60 days prior to an election, and restricted parties' use of funds to advertise on behalf of a candidate. The bill was surely the strictest laws in campaign finance the U.S. had seen in its history at this time, which caused much legal debate, especially among Republican Senator Mitch McConnell, who sued the FEC, claiming the soft money ban exceeded congressional authority granted by the Constitution, and an infringement of the First Amendment. McConnell's case was taken all the way to the Supreme Court. In a confusing and long opinion, the Supreme Court ruled 5-4 to four that the government was not overusing its authority and was not infringing on First Amendment rights. Justices Sandra Day O'Connor and John Paul Stevens emphasized the government needed that authority to prevent corruption and avoidance of law as they claimed money, like water, always finds an outlet. And even though the McCain-Feingold Act would live, that quote would still be relevant with even more challenges to the FEC. The McCain-Feingold Act started to slowly whittle down through more legal disputes, especially when the group called Wisconsin Right to Life sued the FEC as the group sought to run advertisements within the 60 days prior to an election, stating that their ads were not associated with candidates or the election. The FEC countered that their ads were trying to avoid the law by appearing they wouldn't support a candidate, but their intention was to influence the election. The Supreme Court decided in a 5-4 ruling that the restrictions on political advertisements were unconstitutional, as the majority opinion emphasized that the ads were genuinely based on important issues and not based on swaying an election. There would soon be more cases that stripped parts of the McCain-Feingold Act, but those cases would soon be extremely overshadowed by possibly the most significant and controversial campaign finance case in U.S. history. In 2008, before the Democratic primary elections, a conservative nonprofit group named Citizens United attempted to release advertisements for their documentary that critiques Democratic candidate Hillary Clinton. The documentary would violate the McCain-Feingold Act, which prohibits corporations or unions from running these kinds of election communication and media 30 days before a primary election. Citizens United countered and sued the FEC, stating that they violated their First Amendment rights. Citizens United brought their case all the way to the Supreme Court, and along ideological lines, the Supreme Court ruled 5-4 to four in favor of Citizens United, stating that the McCain-Feingold Act's prohibition of all independent expenditures by corporations and unions violated free speech in the First Amendment. This was huge. The ruling would free unions, nonprofits, and corporations to spend unlimited money to support or oppose candidates in elections. So out of all of the legal history and case history I just talked about, what does it have to do with money and politics today? All of these finance laws and Supreme Court decisions leading up to the Citizens United case would give way to billions of dollars being raised and spent in the past decade. These series of cases would give way to the exponential rise of super PACs and dark money, 
making politics even more shadier and money-based. Let's go back to the group called a Political Action Committee, or a PAC. PACs are tax-exempt groups that gather money to fund campaigns or candidates. The FEC, however, does place a limit on how much money PACs can give to a campaign or party. PACs can only give $5,000 to a campaign or candidate each election cycle and $15,000 to political parties. Since corporations and unions can't directly give campaign contributions, they create or donate to PACs that represent their company or some sort of interest. For example, two of the highest fundraising PACs were the National Association of Realtors and the National Beer Wholesalers Association. There are also PACs from companies like the AT&T PAC, Comcast PAC, and Honeywell PAC. These PACs then give to candidates who represent their interests as politicians receive millions of dollars for their campaigns every election cycle. In the most recent election cycle, $66 million was raised for candidates in both the Democratic and Republican parties. But all of that money is minimal compared to PAC's bigger brother called Super PACs. A Super PAC is the product of the Citizens United case, where they are labeled as independent expenditure political committees. The Citizens United case ruled against independent expenditure prohibition from corporations and unions, but the term independent is very important here. Unlike regular PACs, Super PACs cannot directly give money to campaigns or candidates and cannot be associated with the campaign. As long as they are independent from the campaigns, they can raise and spend unlimited funds to praise or discredit any candidate, usually through targeted advertisements. You have probably seen some of these ads on TV or online, where the ads don't have the candidate's approval of the message at the end of the ad, but rather the super PAC claiming responsibility for the ad. Super PACs are more broad than PACs relative to branding, as they aren't too obvious who they represent in their title, like there's the Preserve America PAC, or Unite the Country, or the most known super PAC from this election cycle, the Lincoln Project. While they're broad in name, they're specific in their targeting. So how much do these super PACs raise and spend? According to the Center of Responsive Politics, super PACs have combined to raise $3.4 billion and spend $2.1 billion just for the 2020 election cycle. That figure has increased steadily since the Citizens United and SpeechNow.org case and will surely continue to get higher and higher in billions in future cycles. But who gives super PACs all of this money? Well, super PACs are required by the FEC to disclose their donors and how they spend the money, so it is public information to see who donated what. The Lincoln Project, for example, got money from universities, Amazon, Bain Capital, Microsoft, Comcast, United Health Group, and other super PACs. So really, anyone can donate to super PACs. There's also another kind of group who gives tons of money to super PACs, but unlike super PACs, these certain groups do not have to disclose where they got their money from. Enter dark money groups. Dark money groups are political groups that file as 501c4 to the IRS, making them tax exempt and under a loophole in the IRS code, these groups do not have the legal obligation to disclose who they get their money from. So like a super PAC, dark money groups can raise unlimited money from corporations and unions, and they can spend that money to influence elections or to give to super PACs to do the work for them. However, in order to keep the status from the IRS, influencing elections cannot be the dark money group's primary objective, while a super PAC can make that their primary objective. Since 2008, Dark money groups have funneled over $1 billion to political groups to influence elections. So overall, there is no doubt money is significant in American election cycles. But why should people care? Are these groups really concerning? What's the big deal here? One of the main concerns people have about these money groups is whether they impede on the representation of the people in government. 
the concern is more related to the dealings of regular PACs. As I said before, politicians have taken millions from PACs each election cycle, and these PACs are typically special interest and want something in return. So instead of working for the people, politicians may be more inclined to work on behalf of the special interests who gave him that money. This issue has been debated among politicians, as some have actually sworn off PAC money, like Republican Representative Matt Gates and Democratic Representative Ro Khanna. This may be strategic for them, as they can claim that they are truly for the people, unlike the people who take PAC and interest money for themselves. And maybe that's just how it should be. That issue is surely related when it comes to super PACs. A problem people have with the high spending of super PACs is that the money mostly comes from millionaires and billionaires. And those rich people and companies have found a way to weaponize the super PAC. If a certain politician does something a special interest isn't fond of, rich companies can funnel money into super PACs that will rail that politician and raise money for a certain opponent. We have seen this in action with the Lincoln Project, whose goal is to attack Trump and anyone that's pro-Trump. Former President Donald Trump has also created a super PAC, which he deems will go after anyone who is against his rhetoric, specifically emphasizing Mitch McConnell. So the problem here may be the decisions and thoughts of the people are not exactly being taken into account, as super PACs fuel money to influence people to vote a certain way. The pressure from rich super PACs also gives rich people and companies leverage over politicians as politicians may have to legislate what those interests want in order to prevent them from being challenged. The argument here is that super PACs are becoming the voice and mind behind politicians, which is essentially corruption. Then there's dark money, possibly the most sketchy of all these groups. The fact that we don't know where money to influence election is coming from is very concerning. Could it be foreign influence? Extremist influence? Some have argued this harasses democracy even more, as the voters are influenced even more by groups that they've never even heard of. Dark money also makes it tougher to hold accountability on who is really influencing these elections. How can the people hold rich and powerful groups responsible and accountable if they don't even know where the money is coming from? These issues are quite tough to battle due to special interests and the Supreme Court precedents. People in Congress have and are attempting to fight back against PACs and dark money with new bills, but ideological opposition and Supreme Court precedents are surely the largest barriers. It will be hard for them to limit super PACs if they are protected by the First Amendment. They would need an override of the Citizens United case in the Supreme Court, which currently would be quite difficult with conservative judges having the majority and would most likely vote in favor of protecting the ruling. Lawmakers may be able to slowly fortify campaign finance laws with incremental laws, but they would have to tread quite carefully in order to stay away from constitutional trouble. So overall, PACs, super PACs, and dark money groups are here to stay for the time being. Money in politics is definitely a significant and controversial topic, especially in the United States. Throughout history, it's easy to see that when you have the money, you have the power. Money can get you elected, get others elected, and get laws passed. Money is a machine in Washington, D.C., but most people are really starting to see how deep this hole really goes. Politicians have the stereotype of being liars and corrupt, and they to this day play the part of that trope, as politicians need money from rich interest groups and individuals so they can stay in power but this gives those groups the leverage. That's what's most concerning about PACs, super PACs, and dark money groups. They have infiltrated democracy and politicians. Instead of the people adding or removing people from office, it seems to essentially be these groups that are causing these moves. This topic will surely be disputed and debated in the coming years, and there's surely to be a new Supreme Court case that could upheld or strike down these groups. Groups or no groups, Cash is surely king in politics.